In today's talk, I'm going to be talking to you about large eddy simulation, or LES as it's more commonly known. There are many sources of information about uh, LES online in publications and talks that people have given. However, I found that many of these talks tend to focus uh, on the filtering operations and the governing equations behind uh, LES, really a lot of the theory, and don't tend to give a lot of practical uh, explanations and instructions as to how one might go about setting up their own large eddy simulation. So in today's talk, I've decided to put a different spin on LES that you might uh, be used to in other sources. And really, I'm going to be focusing on helping you understand large eddy simulation, how you might simulate it, uh, and what are metrics you can use when you're looking at large eddy simulation for yourself. So this is going to be a, a different talk to what you might be useful for, for large eddy simulation. Uh, so sit back, take some notes. Uh, here we go. So before I get into the talk in detail today, I just want to run through a few quick points. And the first assumption that I'm going to be making here is that you've already carried out some RANS computations for yourself and you're comfortable with RANS. And you're watching this talk thinking that you'd like to now move on and carry out uh, your LES case. Or maybe you've run an LES case and you'd actually look like a bit of guidance for best practice on how to do that. And this talk is only really going to be covering the basics of large eddy simulation because, as I'm sure you appreciate, it's quite a large and complex topic and I don't really want to go through the entirety of large eddy simulation in one talk. So more details will be coming in future talks. Today I'm only going to be looking at the basics. So to start off with some background for large eddy simulation, the first thing we need to appreciate is that Turbulent flows contain eddies with a range of sizes and energies. So the image that I've got for you there on the slide is just a sheared profile that you would find in a lot of wall bounded flows. And you can see in gray, that's the mean velocity profile. So the mean velocity profile is sheared. And then a nice way of thinking of a turbulent flow is that a turbulent flow has a mean flow profile with a range of eddies superimposed on top of it. So you can see the eddies in red there in the picture. And the eddies have a range of sizes and energies. You've got some very big eddies there, all the way down to very small eddies. And the result of those eddies, of course, is that if you put a probe in the flow and you looked at the instantaneous velocity field, what you would find is something like the plot you can see there in red, that the local flow field varies considerably around some mean value. And that's because there are a range of eddies at that location which are, are passing through that location. And in doing large eddy simulation, what we're gonna do is we're going to resolve some of these eddies with a computational mesh. And this is different, of course, to a RANS calculation where we don't resolve any of the eddies. So we need to resolve some of these eddies with our computation. How do we do that? The first thing you need to think about is how to resolve an eddy with a CFD mesh. And the way to think about an eddy is in the diagram I've got for you on the slide there. And we need a minimum of four cells to resolve an eddy. So on the right there, you've got an image of some eddy of some size uh, that may exist in a flow field somewhere. And then on the left, I've just got four cells. And you can see from the velocity vectors that this is the minimum possible resolution that we can use for an eddy. And we've got the velocity vectors pointing in a circle there, and that allows us to give a numerical representation of the eddy. Now, of course, our CFD mesh is gonna have more than four cells. And what I've got for you here is just a, a grid of four by four cells, which is 16 cells. And what you can see is that this mesh is actually capable of resolving med, uh, eddies with a variety of sizes. So you can see I've got a larger eddy there on the left, which is kind of four units in length and four units in height, all the way down to a smaller eddy, which you can see there on the right. So this will give you some appreciation that if you have a CFD mesh, then that mesh is capable of resolving a range of different eddy sizes. And of course, in practice, if you look at the flow field, you won't see these cleanly resolved eddies in the velocity vectors because you're gonna have a variety of different eddies superimposed on top of each other in the flow field. So you won't be able to see them, but this is actually just something that is gonna help you appreciate uh, what the mesh is actually doing underneath. So you can see with the mesh, the mesh is capable of resolving a variety of eddy sizes. However, it's very important to appreciate 
that the mesh can't resolve eddies that are smaller than the width of two cells. And the reason for that, of course, is that in CFD, we calculate and store the velocity field at the cell centroids. So if you look at that image there, you can see on the slide, I've got a very small eddy, and that eddy is smaller than the size of a cell. And because the cell only has one value at the centroid, that's a velocity at the centroid, and the flow varies, of course, linearly across the cell, the cell itself is not capable of resolving that swirling motion within the cell. We actually need a minimum of four cells in order to be able to get a velocity that's doing a swirling motion. And so what this slide shows you is that the mesh is only capable of resolving cells that are larger than a certain size. So what do we do about eddies that are smaller than the size of the mesh? Because in large eddy simulation, we're not able to simulate all of the eddies. Well, the answer is we use a subgrid scale model. And subgrid, of course, means that it's a model for uh, modeling the effects of eddies that are smaller than the grid. And I'm not really gonna go into detail too much on the subgrid scale models in this talk, but I'll address those in future videos. So we've now got a situation where we've got, uh, we've got a mesh, let's say with uh, four cells, uh, four cells in width and four cells in height. And what we can see from the diagram is that as soon as we, as soon as we create our mesh for the CFD uh, simulation, the mesh is setting the minimum size of the eddy that can be resolved. And for those of you who've looked into LES in a bit more detail, this is implicit LES, we're doing implicit filtering. So you can see on the slide there, I've got a range of eddies for you, starting with the, the large eddy on the left, decreasing in size down to that small eddy, and the mesh is able to resolve and represent all of these eddies until you get to that eddy on the right, which is too small, and so that will have to be captured and represented by the subgrid model. It's not gonna be resolved in the mesh. So the question at this, side, at, this, at this time is, how fine does the mesh actually need to be? We're not gonna be resolving all of the eddies. How, how, much, of, how much of the uh, eddies should, be, should we be resolving? And while you're making this decision, it's important to remember, of course, that the finer you make your mesh, of course, the longer the calculation is going to take because very fine meshes have a large number of cells and they take a long time for CFD codes to solve. So we can't go all the way down to get the smallest eddies. How far do we need to resolve? And what I'm gonna be showing you here today is how we can make a good estimate of the size of the mesh we should be doing before carrying out the LES, because often the LES calculation will take a long time to run, and so we'd like to do as much of the work up front before we actually start the LES case from running. So. What I'm going to show you here is a good way you can just estimate approximately how uh, good your mesh should be before setting off the LES run. And in order to understand how we make a good estimate of the mesh size, what we need to do is have an appreciation for the turbulent energy cascade. And that's what I'm going to move on to talk about next. So in the turbulent energy cascade and in a number of things related to eddies and CFD, you'll often see the wave number phrase uh, in lots of documentation. And normally we think of wave numbers in terms of uh, linear waves in space. And I want you to think of the wave number that's associated with an eddy that's moving in a circular motion. And an eddy with a diameter d has a wave number of two pi over d. And so the important thing to take away from this slide is really that smaller eddies have a higher wave number because their spatial frequency is much higher. And the other important point to note from this slide is in a lot of LES and uh, turbulence literature, uh, wave number is denoted by uh, the letter K. And of course, for those of us who've done a lot of RANS calculations, we're used to K being the turbulent kinetic energy. So it's so important to take care here because K can mean the wave number or it can mean the turbulent kinetic energy. So that's a very common tripping point. Uh, but for now, all we need to appreciate is that we have eddies with a variety of sizes and as the eddies get smaller, their diameter reduces, so their wave number increases. Now what we're gonna do is move on to look at the turbulent energy cascade itself. And the turbulent energy cascade 
takes the rough form of the plot you can see there on the slide. And I've used a simplified form without any uh, data, so it's a lot easier to appreciate. And the turbulent energy cascade was uh, derived from a series of experiments. And you can look up this turbulent energy cascade if you want, either just through a Google search or through uh, any uh, appropriate turbulence reference book. And you'll often find uh, Cole Magorov uh, referenced in those experiments in his relationship to the turbulent energy cascade. So what is the turbulent energy cascade? Well, it shows how the turbulent energy is distributed amongst the eddies. So not all of the eddies have the same amount of turbulent kinetic energy. And if we look at the graph, starting uh, at the origin, if we move to the right along the x-axis, on the x-axis we have wave number, which remember was the inverse of the eddy size. So large eddies have small wave numbers and small eddies have large wave numbers. So as we move to the right on the graph, the eddies are getting smaller. And what we see from the graph is that actually the large eddies contain most of the turbulent kinetic energy. And intuitively, that's what we'd expect. We'd expect those large swirling eddies that we see in a turbulent flow to contain most of the energy. And an important point to remember for this plot is that the y-axis is kinetic energy density, so not just turbulent kinetic energy. And I'll show you why in the next few slides. So the reason that this turbulent energy cascade is plotted against the kinetic energy density is because the area under the curve or the integral gives the turbulent kinetic energy. And this integral, the turbulent kinetic energy, this is the quantity that we're solving for when we do a RANS calculation. So in a RANS calculation, you calculate the turbulent kinetic energy throughout the entire domain. And this is the total kinetic energy at each of the points in the domain. But of course, in the RANS calculation, you don't know how the energy is distributed amongst the eddies. And that's the information we get in the turbulent energy cascade. So we see that the energy is distributed amongst the eddies, it's high for the large eddies, and the energy density is low for the small eddies. And if we integrate or total the energy associated with all of those eddies, we get the turbulent kinetic energy. So now, now what we'll do is we'll take a step back and think about our large eddy simulation that we're doing. In our large eddy simulation, we're not resolving all of the eddies with our mesh because we're not able to. We're only resolving some of the eddies because at a certain point, remember, our grid size is too large and the smaller eddies are contained within the grid in that one cell and we can't resolve them. So the way to think about this in terms of the energy cascade is that at some point along the x-axis, we have uh, the smallest possible eddy that our mesh can resolve. And I've put that in the box. And everything to the left of that on the graph is resolved by the mesh. And what you can see that that means is that our mesh is able to resolve a large proportion of the turbulent kinetic energy. However, the turbulent kinetic energy to the right of that point, that area, that energy is not resolved by our mesh. And that energy needs to be accounted for with some kind of model. And that's going to be accounted for in the subgrid scale model, which I'm not going to go into today. So the first real key message from this talk, and it's important to remember, is that a good or a high quality large eddy simulation will resolve at least 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. And that's a phrase which you may hear uh, in various turbulence uh, publications and uh, talking points. So 80%, of course, is quite, a, is quite a rough number. Some people will say 90%. You'll hear other values. But for the moment, we're just going to say 80%. And so the metric you're interested in is that a good LES will resolve at least 80% of the energy. And what does that mean? Well, in terms of the energy cascade, it means that 80% of that total area under the graph will be resolved by our mesh. And that means what you can see again from the diagram is that if you drew a line upwards from where our smallest eddy was, then 80% of that energy we'd be resolving in the CFD and 20% would be contained in our model. And so this is a useful way for us to uh, intuitively compare large eddy simulations and to understand the difference in quality that they have. So on the left here, what you can see is that if we use a very coarse mesh, that means our cells are very big, that means that actually our smallest eddy size is quite large. And you can see from the plot that actually with this large eddy simulation, we're not resolving a large enough proportion of the turbulent kinetic energy. 
And so what we would do is we would refine our mesh moving into the plot on the right. And now the smallest eddy that the mesh can resolve is a lot smaller and we're resolving a lot more of the turbulent kinetic energy. So this is what's meant by a, sort of a good or a high quality LES simulation. We're resolving more of the turbulent kinetic energy. But that raises the question, now that we understand intuitively what a good large eddy simulation is, how do we do that in practice? How do we ensure that our mesh is actually fine enough and is able to resolve those small eddies so that we get 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy? Well, this is actually quite a difficult question to answer. And the reason for that is that the energy size and energy will vary throughout the domain that we're trying to solve in our CFD calculation. And to illustrate that point, what I've got for you here is just a simple diagram of flow over a backward facing step, which is a very standard test case that you'll see in CFD. And just to help you understand, on the left you can see uh, the, in, the inflow is coming in and they've got some very small low energy eddies there. And at that location in the flow field and in the mesh, we would have an energy spectrum. And I've drawn a quick sketch of that in the red box, which you can see there. But now if we move along the domain to the right, of course, after the step, we're going to uh, generate a recirculation region and lots of turbulence. And at that location in the mesh, we've got larger eddies and our energy spectrum is going to look very different. And so what this means is that single energy spectrum that we just looked at is actually going to vary everywhere in the domain. And so uh, intuitively, we will have to think, well, we need to resolve 80% of the energy spectrum at each point in the domain. Now, very quickly, it starts to become uh, quite difficult to do. Uh, but intuitively, we understand that at each point in the domain, we look at the local energy spectrum and we want to resolve 80% of that with the local mesh. So, of course, the mesh is going to have to change in the domain to ensure that we get at least 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. So how do we do that? Well, when we're making our first mesh for LES, what we want to do is we want to make a good guess for how good the mesh can be. And then later on, we can always refine it in the same way that we would do with a RANS calculation. And the way we're going to make that initial guess is by looking at the integral length scale. And the way to think about the integral length scale is the diagram which I've got for you on the slide here. So on the left, you could see that at a given location in the domain, we've got lots of eddies of different sizes and different energies. And then on the right, what we've got is the integral length scale, which is a single eddy which represents all of the eddies at that location in the domain. And the important thing to think about with this slide is that this is a single value. So this is a single eddy with a size and a single energy. And that eddy is going to be representative of all of the eddies at that location. And for us, when we're making our mesh, this makes it a lot easier as we only have to track that single quantity, the integral length scale, rather than the spectrum throughout the entire domain. So we're going to look at this integral length scale, which is a single value. And what is the integral length scale? Well, the integral length scale is the length of an eddy at the average kinetic energy of all the eddies at that location. So that's a, that's a bit of a mouthful, but what does it really mean? Well, if we think about the energy cascade that we just have, and if we took the average of that energy cascade, what's the average energy, then the integral length scale is the size of the eddy at the average kinetic energy. So this is the way you could also think of it as an energy averaged eddy. That's the way that the integral length scale is defined. And we're going to use this quantity, the integral length scale, uh, to help set up our mesh for LES. So now if we go back to our backward facing step domain, now we have a different way of looking at it. Now at the inflow, of course, we've now got and eddies which have a very low energy and so they'll have a small integral length scale because their energy is lower comparatively and if we look on the right after our uh, flow has separated and is recirculating from that backward facing step the eddies have a lot higher energy and so the integral length scale is going to be larger so now you can see quite quickly that we're just tracking this integral length scale throughout our domain and that gives us an indication of what the eddies are going to be like at that location so the really important point with the integral length scale is that we can actually calculate that from a RANS calculation. So if you have your domain, let's say the backward facing step flow, and you wanted to do a large eddy simulation of it, you would need to do a RANS calculation first. 
And this is standard for pretty much all large eddy simulations. You always run a RANS calculation first before you upgrade it to a large eddy simulation. And when we finish that RANS calculation, we can actually calculate the integral length scale. And if we do, if we ran the RANS calculation with the k-epsilon model or the k-omega model or k-omega SST, it doesn't matter. We can always calculate the integral length scale. And I've got the definitions there for you on the slide in the boxes. And so what you would do is you would go into your post processor, uh, like let's say uh, ParaView, FieldView, Fluent Post or CFX Post, and define a new field, which would be this integral length scale. And you'd be defining it as the, the ratio of those turbulent scalars that we calculated in the RANS calculation. And if you plot that on the field, you'll get a plot which looks something like the plot I've got for you on the slide. And this is a length scale, so it's in meters. And of course you can see that the red region has an integral length scale of around 0.03 meters and then it gets a lot smaller in the blue regions. So this is fantastic. We've run our RANS calculation and we've used the K, Epsilon and Omega to calculate an integral length scale throughout the entire flow field and we can look at it. So we're now getting very close to being able to define the mesh for the LES calculation. And what does the integral length scale mean? Well, if we look back at our backward facing step flow, well, near the inflow, the integral length scale that we've just calculated is very small. So that means when we make our mesh, we'll have to have very small cells there. Whereas if we look uh, further downstream where the eddies have a lot more energy, uh, the integral length scale is larger. So we can get away with using larger cells at that location because the turbulent kinetic energy, of course, is primarily contained by the larger eddies, which will be resolved by that mesh. Fantastic. But how do you actually do this in practice? Well, as a good estimate, five cells across the integral length scale is likely to resolve 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. So this, this estimate will allow us to now go from the integral length scale to the mesh size. So in the diagram, which I've shown you there on the slide, I've got a, a numerical resolution of, a, of an eddy at the integral length scale, you can see it's a, got, a, got a diameter or an effective distance L0. And if we want to resolve five cells across the integral length scale, then that gives us an equation for what the local cell size delta should be. And it will be L0 over five. And so straight away, what you could do is go to your integral length scale, uh, which you just calculated, divide that by five, and then that's roughly going to be the cell size that you need in order to resolve 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. Remember, of course, this is an estimate and an approximation, and we could refine it later. And of course, it's also worth noting here that if you use more than five, if you use 10 cells, then remember you'd resolve more of the turbulent kinetic energy than if you use less cells. And the way to think about this in terms of the turbulent energy cascade is that if we start at that integral length scale with the red dotted line, if we now make the cells a lot finer and a lot smaller, what we're actually doing is we're moving to the right along the graph. And the more that we refine the mesh, the more of that energy spectrum we're gonna be resolving in our large eddy simulation. And we're just using the, uh, the estimate that five cells tends to be good to resolve 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. So moving to the, to the right across that plot. Now, an easier way to do it would be to define a new field. So if we take uh, equation one, which is the local cell size delta, we want that to be uh, the integral length scale divided by five or perhaps even finer, then a quick and easy way to do it is to define a new field, which I'm just gonna call F, doesn't really matter what you call it, and define that as the integral length scale divided by the local cell size. So if we now flip it and do it that way round, um, then what we can do is plot this new field F in the post processor in the same way that we did for the integral length scale. And then we can look directly at the flow field and where F is less than five, that tells us that the cells are too big and we need to refine them. So this is a, an alternative way of thinking about it. Rather than using the integral length scale to calculate the cell size, we could also just use the integral length scale to look at the mesh we've already got and then tell us which areas are good and which areas are bad, are they too coarse and we need to make the cells finer. So here's just an example of that field F. So I took the same case with that integral length scale, 
And then what I did was divided that by the local cell size, which you can approximate as the cube root of the cell volume. And you can see now from the contour plots that in regions which are red, that means the ratio is 20, it's, it's far more than five, and the cells there are fine. They're, they're sufficiently small that they're gonna be resolving at least 80% of that turbulent kinetic energy. But in the regions that are blue, you can see that the ratio there is less than five. And so that means that the cells are currently too big and we need to go back into the mesh generator and make them smaller for our large eddy simulation because we don't think we're gonna be resolving enough of the turbulent kinetic energy at those points. So just a quick summary and to wrap up what I've talked about today in this introduction to large eddy simulation. Remember when you're creating your mesh, it's the smallest cell size that determines the fraction of the turbulent kinetic energy that's resolved. And smaller cells resolve more of that energy. So the smaller and smaller we make the cell, the more of the turbulent kinetic energy we're resolving with our mesh, and the further along to the right in the turbulent energy cascade we're, we're moving with our resolution. And the aim, as far as I've said it here, is to resolve at least 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy with your LES. Now, it depends by what, uh, what standards and recommendations you want to go with here. You could aim for 80% or 90%. Um, however, uh, most common best practice is to resolve somewhere between 80 and 90% of the turbulent kinetic energy with the LES. And the next statement is that there's uh, an approximate estimate you can use which is that five cells across the integral length scale is a good estimate for how fine your mesh needs to be for resolving 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. So that just about wraps up the talk. Uh, I know that a lot of you in the comment section had been asking for a, a large eddy simulation talk. So let me know how you found it. Did you find it useful and interesting? And would you like to see more large eddy simulation talks? Uh, in the future, I'd like to go into a bit more detail in large eddy simulation and talk about more of the aspects that we need to be thinking about uh, if we carry out large eddy simulation. But hopefully for now, you've, got, you've had a good introduction to large eddy simulation and you've got at least a basic appreciation for what you should be looking for when you uh, see a large eddy simulation case that someone's carried out uh, or you want to carry out one for yourself. So uh, thanks a lot for listening and I'll see you next time.